venue and we are trying to keep as on time as possible. Who would have thought at a conference what you can achieve when you stay on time? Actually, we had our state conference earlier this year and it was just, it was the most on time conference I've ever been to. Shout out to all the crew at Hope Central. They just rule with an iron fist up that way. And um, it was a great conference, but it was, it was amazing. When you, ha- when you stick to time, you can have great conversations in the breaks and things like that. Um, this is me also just um, improvising while everyone comes to take their seats. So come and take your seats, you lot. We're going to get moving. Hey, uh, this session is going to be fantastic. I was keen to not do anything this conference, just to chill out, but then they said, would you like to introduce Jodie Elliott? And I thought, how can I turn that down? Because uh, if you know Jodie Elliott, to know her is to love her. She is uh, not only just a lovable person, but she is an outstanding Christian leader and a fantastic communicator and someone that I'm so proud when I look at our movement. She is someone that I'm so proud to be part of a movement that has... um, a voice like her speaking to the generations is our um, director of the generations and the youth director for the CRC churches. I think the thing I love about Jody is she's a secure Christian leader. She is not trying to be anyone that she's not. She knows who she is and she's able to speak to the younger generations. But I think the thing I love about her as well is she does not define herself by being like a young person or speaking to the young people, but she honours what has come before. And she also has a, a, the ability to speak to all ages and to unite generations. And I think her vision for the generations is what does it look like for us to be the people of God, not just in our own little uh, social demographics, but what does it mean for us to be the people of God and to take our place in the body of Christ? Also, I have to say in this pandemic that there's been a lot of tears, there's been a lot of sadness and her Instagram page is amazing content, amazing content and her husband and kids have been pawns in her uh, production to entertain and and so if you don't follow her on Instagram, follow her, their epic bin night walks are the stuff of, stuff of legend and I've had some literal lols watching that um, on my phone at different stages. So thank you Jody, for the edification of your social media platform, we really appreciate it. Without any further ado, um, can we, wherever we are, put our hands together and welcome Jodie Elliott to bring this session. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, It's so great to be able to be with you at Conference 2021 um, in the wild year that it's been. Um, I feel very privileged and honoured to be asked to speak um, at the conference again and in session two today I feel very honoured to be able to take that session and just be able to share some thoughts um, with you all, so many people that I love um, and value and appreciate um, particularly doing ministry. So um, it's a little bit disappointing that we all can't be there today. Um, this is the first conference that I've missed in 15 years, uh, which may not seem like much to some of you, but that's almost half of my life. Um, and so uh, I am disappointed that I can't be there in Adelaide. I tell you what I'm not disappointed about is the 12 to 13 hour road trip that it takes us to get there. But um, I am going to miss being together and just having those times of fellowship together and worship together. Um, so wherever you're watching from today, whether you're watching um, at Seton, whether you're watching from home, whether you're watching uh, at church or in your office or whether you're in one of the regional hubs, um, I just hope that you are coming expectant and ready to hear from God over the conference for what He wants to do. And even though we're apart, we can still worship together in spirit. We can encourage one another in spirit and we can certainly be inspired in spirit. So. This afternoon, my subject um, that I've been given to talk about is the challenge of loving and serving Jesus in a rapidly changing culture. Now, when I sat down to just mull over what I was going to share in this session, my mind immediately went to uh, my sister, Kirsten. She's my older sister, her baby shower. It was quite some 
years ago and um, we got together down in Naranja where all my family lives and um, in true Murphy tradition this baby shower was a bit of a big do. Um, we had the whole female population of Naranja there and you know we did all of those games that you do at baby showers that nobody actually enjoys but are kind of compulsory to do and um, we did like the you know we opened all the presents and all the women oohed and ahed over the baby little things and the wraps and everyone shared their horrific birth stories which I'm not sure why you do that at a baby shower but we had this amazing baby shower and we we did it in the morning we put on this big spread and um you know, uh, it, w it was a big affair and it was really, it was really amazing. And, um, you know, you may not know this about me or it may be completely really obvious, but I'm a country girl. And so I grew up in Narendra, in the small town of Narendra. And, you know, we came from um, quite a humble family, quite a humble beginnings. We kind of lived the simple life, you know. We had really simple kind of foods and we did simple kind of things, you know, like Pastor Bill, there was no Greek salads in our house. It was kind of meat and veg. We had the iceberg lettuce and the cubed cheese. Like that's kind of the upbringing that I had when we were growing up. But after I um, finished high school, I moved away to the thriving metropolis of Orange and Bathurst area. And um, we, I, I sort of learnt um, a little bit about food, you know. And so when I had come back from my sister's baby shower, I thought I'm going to put on this big spread. We're going to have like this um, smorgasbord of, of exotic foods, right? This is this is going to give you an indication of how simple we grew up. And so um, after the baby shower had all finished, um, what what tends to happen? I don't know if this happens in your family, but certainly in my family, the women all cleared out, and in come the boys, ready to clean up the leftovers. And so I thought oh, I'm going to give my family, I'm going to give these boys like a food education and so in comes my dad and um, I'd got together like this sourdough bread and I'd lightly toasted it and then I'd put on these big pieces of avocado remember when we called it smashed avo and so I'd made that and I put on like this Persian feta cheese and um, then I'd put on a little bit of dukkha and I said dad dad you got to try this this is delicious you got to try this and dad takes one look at it and he's like oh oh disgusting what is that what is it I'm like it's avocado and he said oh no yuck I don't like it I was like come on dad you know really just thinking if he could have a taste he'd see like how amazing it was and he's like no nah, no nah, it's not for me it's not for me I don't do that kind of food I don't do that kind of thing it's not for me and so then I thought oh well dad you know the, the Bible says that you should taste and see that the Lord is good. Are you going to deny him this amazing worshipful experience by partaking in the avocado on toast? And dad was like, nah, nah. And then he ended up saying, you know, like you all, some of you know my dad, his name's Trevor. And many of you would probably think, oh, he's just a nice like country guy, you know, very, um, you know, just a kind kind of guy, simple fly under the radar kind of guy. And he is that kind of guy, but he's also extremely stubborn, you know, extremely stubborn. And so all the persuading that I could do or the spiritual manipulation or the other manipulation, nothing would work. He would not taste it. And he ended up saying to me, Jody, I am content with my current palate. I don't need to add or subtract anything to it. I am just content with my current palate. And you know, when I'm thinking about church and culture, sometimes we can take that exact same stance as my dad took. I am content with my current palate. We can be content living in the boundaries of what we know, what we feel comfortable with. You know, and I'm not talking about, um, you know, our beliefs or our foundational beliefs or our doctrines of truth. I'm talking about being content and comfortable with our traditions, being content and comfortable with our programs, our step-by-step -step systems, our methodologies, our schedules, you know, that kind of, this is the way we've always done it. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, obviously, if you don't want to take avocado, you know, avocado is kind of a take it or leave it option. Obviously it's that. And you can choose to acknowledge avocado, you can choose to add it to your diet. Um, and you know what, you, if, if you don't, if you don't choose to do that, you'll be missing out. But it isn't going to impact the outcome of your life, is it? It's just avocado, although some would beg to differ. But culture, on the other hand, culture is something that if the church does not acknowledge, if some, it's something that if the church does not factor in, it will have a significant impact on our ability to fulfill the Great Commission. Because culture 
is about people. Culture comes from like the ideologies, the customs, the social behaviours of society. It's shaped and moulded and constructed by the very people that Jesus told us to go into the world for. And where once culture was reflective of Christian ideology and there wasn't much for us to really understand about culture, today it's not so much the case. We are living in this postmodern, post-Christian, deconstructionist worldview, you know, where um, morality is seen as like a social construct and truth is subjective to the individual. And in many ways, what we represent as a church, what the church represents and what we're seeing expressed in culture are completely at odds with one another. You know, for many of us, just that thought, just that notion, particularly at this time, can be completely terrifying, can be really overwhelming. And I get it. In many ways, it feels as if the world has gone mad. You know, I saw a meme just the other day and it was a line of aliens lining up and then it had the quote above it, get ready boys, where next? You know, and you know, obviously that's a joke, but it kind of also would not be surprising at this point in time. I'm joking, I don't believe in aliens. But you know, when things just kind of keep coming up, when things just keep on challenge us, challenging us, our natural instincts can be to either shrink in or to fight. That's what we naturally do, that fight or flight method kind of kicks in. So we can go to our default setting, like our default setting could be to just retreat in, to stick solely to our traditions, our customs, our ways of doing things. Or on the other hand, we could go on the defensive, you know, sort of locked and loaded, ready to kind of shoot down anything that moves in the wrong direction. And to be honest, none of these stances are the ideal postures to take. The thing is, we need to understand culture. There's no question about it. We need to understand culture. We need to be sensitive to culture. We don't need to change every aspect of culture and we certainly don't need to challenge everything about culture. You know, I was thinking it's a little bit like parenting. I'm a mum, I've got three little kids and um, they're a bit wild and ready. Some people call them free range. They're a bit like that. That's how we kind of do things out in condo. But you know, how we approach culture can be a bit like parenting. You know, sometimes my kids need direction. Sometimes my kids just need to figure things out on their own. Sometimes my kids need me to model things for them. They need me to show them how to do it, to be the example of how to do it. And sometimes my kids just need a swift kick in the behind, like in a totally legal and appropriate sense, I'm saying that. And as you parent, as I've parented, I've begun to learn things. You know, sometimes it's slow, but I have begun to learn things. You know, and the more that I know about my kids, And the more that I understand the influence and authority that I have as a parent, the better I can discern what action I need to take at any given time. And likewise, the more that we can understand about culture and the more that we can understand about the power and the authority and the influence we have as carriers of the presence of God, the better we can discern how we need to interact with culture, how we should interact with culture. And this is why loving and serving Jesus has to be at the centre of everything that we do. You know, I don't know if you've ever played netball um, and I was thinking, I think the same rule applies in basketball, but it's been a while, I'm a bit rusty. But in netball, one thing that you need to be able to do to be a successful netball player is that you need to learn how to pivot. You need to know the rule of the pivot. And what happens when you pivot is that the leg that you land on when you catch the ball, right, that leg has to stay grounded. It has to stay firmly connected to the ground. It can't move, it can't go anywhere else. That leg has to stay still, it has to stay in, it cannot move. But the other leg is able to move back and forth, you know, sort of to move around in whatever direction, keeping that one leg firm to the ground. So when you can move around, you're able to move the ball around the court in whatever direction you take it. 
If you lift that leg up off the ground, it's called stepping or in basketball, it's all coming back to me, Narendra basketball. Um, it's called traveling, okay? And so the eight, the, the, what you need to be able to do is keep one foot grounded, but you can still effectively move the ball across the court to the other players towards the goal that you're going to if you keep that one leg grounded. And I think that's sort of an approach that we need to take when it comes to church and the culture, when it comes to interacting with culture as a follower of Jesus. We need to have that one foot firmly grounded to the ground. We need to have that our, our foundational foot put firmly on Jesus, not moving, not altering, not shaking, not waved, you know, and that other foot is able to manoeuvre and pivot. I hope you're getting this principle, but be able to sort of like move around so that we can effectively do what He's called us to do, to effectively go into all the world, to effectively be able to do that. But we first need to make sure that we have one foot firmly grounded in who He is and who we are in Him. And if we can do that, we can move around the court. We can move the ball towards the goal without having to forfeit the ball. Because the thing is that God has called us to be in the world, not of it, but in it. He's called us to be in the world, to be the salt and light, to be that city on a hill, to be light in the darkness. And the more we understand that, the more we have revelation of that, the more that we ground our foot in that very thing, the more we realise that we don't actually have to fear culture. We don't actually have to fear the rapid changes that we see happening in culture. We represent the way, the truth and the life. Do you remember singing that song in Sunday school? I am the way, the truth and the life. We represent the way, the truth and the life. We carry in us the very thing that the world is craving. And every day that we engage with culture, every day we um, sort of take that pivot stance within culture, every day we engage with humanity, we offer the world the opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good. And the way that we are able to do this, the way that we can effectively do this is be living our life first and foremostly devoted to loving and serving Jesus. You know, our theme for the conference this year comes from the first part of the Great Commission to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind and with all your soul. You know, I think it's interesting that the loving, this, this passage, this verse that we're looking at, particularly at this conference, the loving came before, his, before the sending. He told us to love the Lord your God before He told us to go. The loving came before the sending because it's our love response to God that actually is the thing that needs to motivate us to go. It is from our real and personal relationship with Jesus, that devotion to Jesus, that effectively enables us to go into culture and love His people. Our love and service to Jesus isn't dependent on what's happening in culture. Our love and service actually transcends culture. And I want you to hear that this morning. Our love and service to Jesus transcends culture because it derives from the fact that He first loved us. We are Christ's followers and in that we find our purpose, we find our meaning, we find our freedom in Christ and what He's done for us. And as long as we can keep our focus, as long as we can keep our perspective on loving and serving Jesus, we're sure to succeed. You know, I love the story of Habakkuk. At first, I loved it because it was the quickest book in the Bible to read. <laughs> but I've come to love it for what it says in it. And what we find in the passage of Habakkuk, in the story of Habakkuk, who's a prophet, and he's sort of like in this very significant moment in human history. And we can draw a lot from the dialogue between Habakkuk and God on how to fulfil the call of God on our lives, how to interact with culture as a follower of Jesus, how to live as someone following the call of God, the direction of God, that great commission that He gave to us in a cultural moment that's quite chaotic. The book sort of starts off with Habakkuk 
crying out to God. He says, how long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralysed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. And then we see God's response to Habakkuk. And he says, look at the nations, watch. Did you hear that? Look at the nations, watch and be utterly amazed. For I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. And so Habakkuk is in this moment where the Babylonians are sort of coming in, they're coming in hot and they're sort of like sweeping through and culture's changing and things are changing and it's really chaotic. We can hear that in the first cry that he makes to God. And Habakkuk is hearing God say, you know, like, just watch, watch, I'm going to do something. And he doesn't fully understand God's response. You can hear that as he replies to God. He's still a bit perplexed by what's happening, trying to remind God of who he is and what he stands for. But at the end of chapter two, in his reply to God, he says, I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the tower and I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what answer I will give as his spokesman when I'm reproved. So what can we see in this dialogue? Number one, and fairly obvious, is that Habakkuk is distressed by the cultural changes that are occurring in his nation. Can anyone relate to Habakkuk? Maybe you've even cried out a similar prayer to what Habakkuk cried out in his complaint to God. Just letting God know that the whole world is against him and everything that he stands for in case he didn't realise. I think we've all probably cried out something like that. And the reality is that if we look throughout history, you know, if we look throughout even just Bible history, but through all history, there are not many of the current cultural and moral issues that we are facing that people in history didn't face either. You know, the enemy is a one trick pony. He's the master of deception. The Bible says that lies are his native language. The, he is the father of lies and his mission is to confuse, to manipulate, to distort truth. You know, it might present as a different name, but it comes with the same face. The reality is that these cultural issues are going to keep presenting themselves, keep challenging us as Christians, keep challenging us as Christ followers until Christ returns. But God doesn't change. His plan for humanity doesn't change. And the challenge for us is not to see ourselves as survivalists, but to see ourselves as people who follow the resurrected Christ. We can feel like we've never been here before. And maybe we haven't. Maybe in our generation, in our lifetime, we haven't faced things that we're facing right now. But I can tell you that others have. And what we can see from history is that every, in these moments when, when it feels like culture is against us, when it feels like the enemy is breathing down our neck with agenda after agenda, with attack after attack, from history, we can see that in these moments, we need to press in to the presence of God. If you look at the Old Testament, the further the Israelites got from Jerusalem, the more supernatural they had to get. The more they had to rely on the Spirit, the more they had to pray, the more they had to worship, the more that they had to press in. The same principles apply for us. We can spend forever trying to understand culture or build our own strategies or plans to either embrace or resist because it's two ways, isn't it? We can have strategies for both to embrace or resist culture. You know, just when you think you've got it figured it out, the world's onto something new. There's something new coming at us and it can be super exhausting. But if we look at God's response to Habakkuk, he says, look at the nations, Watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your day that you would not believe even if you were told. What does this tell us? That God is not concerned with the agenda 
of the world. He's working on his own plan. He has it sorted. And really we as his people need to get on board with his plan. What we need to do is stay close to Jesus. If we can stay in the presence of Jesus, he will lead us, he will guide us, he will direct us, he will give us the strategies. It's not about working out our own strategies. It's not about trying to understand every aspect. It's not about um, trying to come up with some plan or some sort of thing that we can do so that we can win. It's not about us maintaining control. You know, so often that can be the challenge when we don't, when things are uncertain, we try to make our own way that we can get control back. It's not about that. It's about getting close to Him and allowing Him to lead us and taking a posture of readiness, even when we don't fully understand or see what God is doing. What did Habakkuk say? In the midst of not understanding, in the midst of being quite perplexed, he still said to God, I will stand at my watch. I will station myself. I will position myself. I will look to see what he says to me. In other words, I'm going to look above all the going ons. I'm going to look above the reports. I will look beyond the news. I will turn off the notifications. And who knows, sometimes we need to turn off the notifications. I won't get caught up in the ideologies and the doctrines and the agendas. I will position myself to hear from God, to see what it is that He is saying. I will posture myself with this external viewpoint. And I think today, this is the challenge for us as the church. We have to practice getting above the noise and posturing ourselves with this same external viewpoint to hear what it is that God wants to say. Instead of getting caught up in the rhetoric of the moral, the moral decay that's happening in culture at the moment, we need to rise above and see that God is at work. We need to be people who know how to wait upon the Lord. We don't have to understand everything. And if you try to, I wish you good luck. But the Holy Spirit understands. The Holy Spirit knows what's going on. He understands culture. If we can be in the presence of God and we can be tuned into the Holy Spirit, He will guide us. He will direct us. You know, I studied a degree in criminology at university and I sat through four years of sociological classes, um, you know, theory after theory. And at the end of the four years, I can tell you what I came out with. Two things. One, a really large hex debt. And the second thing was the conclusion that nobody has any idea what is going on apart from the fact that the world needs a saviour. <laughs> So we can try and strategize. We can try and theorize. We can study until we're blue in the face. We can make ourselves look smart. We can make ourselves look intelligent. We can make ourselves look like we know what we know, that we know everything and we've got it all figured out. But we can't save people with that method. Jesus is the only one who can save. And it doesn't matter how the world tries to save itself because that's exactly what it's trying to do or become its own God. Everything is basically a counterfeit of Jesus. It shouldn't scare us. It should actually excite us because what it means is that people are searching for something. People are searching. They're searching to connect with God. You know, in today's current climate where it may seem that most of Australia are following this anti-church agenda, if you read the research, you know, McCrindle's research is really exciting. It actually tells us that over 50% of Australians still currently hold primarily Christian values. You know, in the middle of all the chaos that we've seen in the past 18 months, with lots of noise from, you know, extreme left and extreme right and different people with different progressive agendas or conservative agendas on that matter. People in their home have been asking more existential questions about what is the meaning of life than ever before in our generation. 
It would appear that the progressive agenda is making a lot of ground. And every day there's sort of something that feels like it's threatening the church or threatening the work of the church or, or what we stand for. And I can tell you, I know you all know, it's very noisy out there. But God is at work. You know, and I almost feel like God is saying to us, even in this moment right now, He's saying to us, hey, don't back away now. Don't retreat. I'm at work, stay with me, be with me, follow me, look to me, keep your eyes on me because I'm doing something that you wouldn't even believe if I told you. So we don't need to run from it. We need to be full of His presence. Look for His leading and guiding and go in and be the salt and light, directing people for what they're searching for, which is Jesus. You know, if you look at things that are hot topics at the moment, this whole identity agenda, you know, it looks scary. It looks progressive. It looks like things are, you know, what's happening in the world, is it crazy? But what is that agenda really about? People trying to find out who they are, what they're here for, and to find a tribe that they can belong to. Identity, purpose, and belonging. All things we know can only be found in Jesus. This move into the new age spiritualism, searching for spiritualism and everything is very spiritual at the moment. What's it about? Finding, it's, it's, it's attractive to people. That's what it's, it's attractive because people are trying to search for God. You know, the Bible says that He has placed eternity in the hearts of every man. Spirituality in some form is attractive because people are searching for God. They're longing to connect with their Creator. You know, I think God just wants us to get amongst it. I look at the Israelites after they'd been taken captive in Babylon and were exiled and held in captivity. And they're crying out to God for like immediate rescue. You know, this is in Jeremiah 29. They're saying, God, take us back, rescue us. We don't want to be here. You know, the culture that they were in was so at odds to the places where they came from. You know, and he's, they're, they're crying out to God, take us back, we don't belong here. And God says to them, I have carried you into exile and I want you to build houses. I want you to plant gardens. I want you to marry. I want you to have kids. I want you to give your sons and daughters in marriage. I want you to be fruitful and I want you to multiply. And they were in this place where the culture was so against everything that they knew. They were at odds with the culture and they wanted out. They wanted to go back to what they knew. They wanted to go back to the place where they felt content and they felt comfortable. But God says to them, you know, I have put you in this place. I have carried you into exile. And in that place, I want you to be fruitful. And he goes on to say, you know, pray for the peace and prosperity of the place where I've sent you. Because if it prospers, you prosper. Don't get caught up listening to this person or that person. This is what God is saying to them. You know, I haven't sent them. I haven't sent them. You are here for a period of time. And in that time, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to advance. I want you to set up and take ground, build a foundation. That's what he's saying to them. And then he says, the verse that we all know, the bumper verse for Christianity, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. You know, God's plan rarely looks like what we think it's going to look like. And at many times, his plan doesn't actually seem that good to our human understanding. You know, in our family, we've just had this TV for the, I don't know, three or four years. And we've only just figured out that you can actually pre-record like on it. You can record and then watch it later. We've only just figured that out. I told you at the beginning, I came from simple beginnings. And so um, there was a football game that we wanted to watch and we had something on. And so Scott, my husband, he recorded it. And then we were coming back to watch it. And um, you know, for all you people who are in South Australia and Western Australia and Tasmania and Victoria and wherever, you know, I'm from New South Wales and we are rugby league people, right? And so this was a rugby league game. And um, you know, we'd gone out and we came home, we sat down to watch it. And, you know, in the first sort of five minutes or whatever, um, I sort of had hopped onto Facebook to have a look. And as I looked on there, I actually saw the outcome of the game, mostly because I saw all the Manly supporters whinging about the ref, right? So I knew who was going to win and who was going to lose. 
So as I watched that game, you know, I felt the tension of the moments. You know, I saw the, you know, I felt the excitement inside of me for when that try nearly got scored or when there was the big hit up or when there was that controversial call. You know, I felt the tension in the moments as I was watching. But I already knew the outcome of the game. So that kind of anxiety or that pressure that you can sometimes feel when you're waiting for the outcome of a game to happen wasn't there. You know, I enjoyed the moments, I felt the tension, but I already knew the outcome. And I think sometimes we've got to get back and take that similar kind of perspective. We've got to trust that God's got it and that he's going to give us the strategies to move through the tension, knowing that in the end he wins, knowing that he is building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And so as the church, our focus needs to be on what is important. And that's not replicating culture. It's not about being hip. It's not about being trendy or attractive or flashy. And I've got to tell you, I love those things. You know, I love creativity. I love, you know, there's aspects of culture that I love and that I love have come into the church. But it's actually not about that. And by the same token, it's also not about fighting against every single culture issue that comes against us or staying stuck in our traditions. You know, sure, there's absolutely a time for flipping tables. We saw that in the ministry of Jesus in the time that Jesus was here. But for the most part, it's about loving Jesus, serving Jesus, and in that, becoming more like him. You know, at the end of the day, take the mask off everything. God is pursuing his people. At the end of the day, everything that presents itself as a challenge, take it all away, strip it back to nothing. God is pursuing his people. And as much as our programs and entertainment and marketing are great tools, and they absolutely are, they can only do so much. The world is offering the same message of hope and love and community and acceptance and belonging. And people can find it all at the click of a button on their phone. But what the world cannot offer, what the world cannot give, what culture cannot offer, what culture cannot provide is an encounter with Jesus. The world cannot offer a peace that transcends all understanding. The world cannot offer the fullness of joy that can only be found in his presence. And so we as a church need to have our heart, need to have our mind, need to have our focus set like that pivoted, like that foot that doesn't pivot in the game of netball on loving and serving Jesus. We need to practice being in his presence. We need to, like Habakkuk, get up on our post and keep watch for what it is that he is saying because he is working. Even if we don't see it or feel it, even if we don't understand it, he is working and he's calling us to watch because he is going to do something in our lifetime that we wouldn't even believe if he told us. And so this afternoon, you know, maybe you entered this conference, you know, whether you're at Seaton, whether you're at home, whether you're watching in a hub or watching, you know, overseas, hello to all our P&G people and all the people overseas. You know, whatever you entered the conference in, maybe the noise has got too much for you. Maybe even the thought of talking about culture makes you want to block your ears and cry. It's noisy out there. It's heavy. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of challenge for us as we navigate, especially this next season. But I want to tell you that if you can practice getting into the presence of God, if you can carve out time where your priority is to focus on loving and serving Jesus, you will be able to move through this. And so I want to encourage you right now as I finish up, maybe even right now, you know, you are just beaten and worn out 
exhausted, got no ideas left, <laughs> sick of trying to control it all, sick of trying to give an opinion, sick of trying to take a side. I don't know what it is, whatever it is. Can we just for a moment sit in the presence of God, posture ourselves with that external viewpoint like Habakkuk and hear from the Lord, allow his presence to wash over us. You know, my good friend, a pastor in Orange Church, Daniel, he says, I've never got into the presence of God and regretted it. Maybe that's what we need to have as our posture every day, to get into the presence of God, to fill ourselves with his spirit, to make decisions not out of fear, not out of anxiety, not out of pressure, not because we're worrying about what someone will say about us, but because we've been directed by the Holy Spirit, because we're seeing that God is at work. We know that God is at work and we are confident in the work that he's doing. Can I ask you just to stand for a moment and I'm just gonna pray over you. And I'm really believing that maybe if you've walked in today and you are absolutely up to here with culture, that the presence of God would come, that the Holy Spirit would just move on you today and you will feel a freedom. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you know every person, Father. You know them intimately, Lord. You know what their journey has looked like. You know what they're navigating now, maybe as a leader, leading their family, leading their friends, leading, leading their business, leading their ministry group, leading their church, Father, even for the leaders within our movement. You know, Father, exactly what pressure, you know exactly what challenges they are facing. And Father, I pray right now, even as we stand, that we would just feel a fresh touch of your presence upon us this afternoon. That we would feel that weight, that burden lifted, Father. That we would be reminded in this moment to just take a breath, to just breathe you, Father. To feel your presence, to feel your touch, to feel your peace, Lord. That we would be reminded that you are at work that you are the beginning, that you are the end. And you know how this works. And so Father, I just pray that you would meet us where we're at right now, Lord. That you would remind us to daily be in your presence. To, to not abandon our post, Father, but to be on our post and be watchful for what you are doing. We thank you for the time that we've had, Lord. Thank you for what you're going to do in the rest of this conference, Father. I pray that you bless every person here who hears this message today, wherever they are, Father. Bless them, encourage them, and let us be people who are filled with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jody. And why don't we just stay standing here in Adelaide, but also I did that deliberately once some of you had sat down just to increase the awkward night. <laughs> but wherever you are, I just thought it'd be good just to extend that for a moment and just to stay in a, a, a prayerful state because um, I'm aware that some of us in this last year have had to become experts in public health and um, medicine, critical theory, um, right-wing fundamentalism and it's like you know neo-marxism it's like there's all these words to describe some of the cultural things that are happening not just in the fringes of our society but I would say on the fringes of the church as well and we're there's just so much pressure on us as Christian leaders to become experts in areas that we have not been trained. There's a lot of pressure to be the smartest person in the room when you and Jesus both know that you're not. And the pressure is immense. So many people are just saying, this is not, it's like, I just want to run a program for young people. I don't want to worry about 
compliance and work health safety and policy documents and it's like the complications are increasing and the simplicity is being stripped away. And I think this session has been a reminder from Pastor Jody that in a time when, yes, we have to ask the question, God, what are you doing in our world? What, are, what is happening in the culture? We see the Apostle Paul in Acts 17. He was overwhelmed by the idolatry in the culture in Athens. Yet in the midst of that, he was not demoralized to the point where he was not able to speak a word of life to say, let me tell you about the God that you're searching for. And for all of us in this room, I, I really think that there's, if, if, if I was a demon, I would know how to take me out. It's through getting me to focus on the wrong thing, through distraction, deception, demoralizing me, discouraging me, just distorting the truth. Guys, let's be as smart and shrewd as we can in observing the culture, but let us never get to the point where the light that we speak into that culture is diminished. That is the very power that people ultimately don't need to be convinced by your argument. They need to be um, drawn to not all of your answers, but to the answer that you have. And I think that's the call that Jody left us with is the light. What is the light that is shining within us? The light of the gospel, the light of the hope of Jesus that, in the words of Romans 5, will not disappoint. Can we just open ourselves to that? Father, open our hearts to the areas of our culture where we need to become more attuned. Open our eyes to the parts of our culture that we have, we have been overwhelmed. Release us from the burdens that we are carrying that you don't want us to carry. And Father, may we not just be experts in the culture, but we become novices in living lives of joy and peace and purpose. May we show that we are Christians, not by having all of the answers, but by showing that we have love and peace that transcends understanding. And so for everyone here in this room in Adelaide, but everyone also worshipping online and watching online, I pray that you meet with us, that you gently encourage us from the inside out, that we have the words of life, that we have the words of hope, and that we can speak into and we can draw people into your presence, into your loving kindness, by gently reaching out and just allowing your love and your presence to shine through us. Fill us with your spirit. We don't want to be Pentecostals in um, name only. We want to be filled with your spirit so that we are people of overflow, people of generosity and excess, so that when we spill out, people are drawn to that overwhelming um, living water that flows through us, that comes from the perpetual stream that Jesus Christ offers. So fill us and encourage us where there has been discouragement. And we thank you for good things ahead. We pray that you just um, grow good seed, grow good fruit from this message that has been uh, planted into our hearts today. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together and thank um, Jody wherever we are? Hopefully she can hear this. I'd like to hand over to um, Nick uh, Johnson, and as he shares with us about uh, the CRC College. So put your hands together and welcome him. Well, hello, everyone. It's been a great conference so far. And uh, how good was Jody? Jody's phenomenal, and uh, she was also a graduate of CRC training. So just shameless little plug there. But thank you, Jody, for that uh, message. That was fantastic. Um, with the help of the National Executive and over the last couple of years, uh, the CRC College and CRC Training has gone through a bit of a, a values and identity um, journey itself. And that has kind of led us to today and to this moment where I'm really pleased to be able to announce that we uh, will be known by a different name from this point onwards, which we are launching today. And I'll pop a video on in a moment. But it's not just a name or an identity that we decided to 
change just for the sake of it, um, but is actually what we felt like fully reflected not only who we currently are, but who we desire to be going forward for the years that are to come. And so, uh, yeah, I'm going to get you to turn your eyes to the screen and then I'll jump back up in a sec. As we have faced new challenges and the changing of circumstances, we have learned to adapt and overcome them. With the grace of our God and the wonders of technology, we'd like to introduce you to our next season as a college. We wanted to begin by taking the time to honour some of those who have played an important role in the foundation of CRC College of Ministry. It all began with Pastor Leo Harris and the Deputy Principal, Pastor Lyle Phillips, in 1959 in Adelaide at Sunrise House. Through the years, there have been many who have imparted their knowledge, mentored and encouraged new leaders, helping pastors develop in their ministry. We admire those whose paths we now follow and acknowledge their contributions, such as Pastor Tom Foster, Dr. Barry and Ken Chan, Pastor Tony Smith, Pastor Mike Cronin, Pastor Ray Gilmore, and so many more. When Dr. Rob Nighouse stepped into his role as National Training Director, we started to see a new season. In the time since then, Pastor Chris Carmody and his team have seen the college expand into higher education programs alongside our facilitation camps, international tours, and mission trips. Since the creation of CRC Churches International, a heart of revival has been central to all we do. After all, it is our middle name. Over the last 18 months, we've been working on rebranding the college in preparation for the next season which God is leading us into. We are pleased to present to you right now our new name, Revival College. Revival College is an extension of this heartbeat with an operational focus on foundation, formation, connection and commission. We believe every person has been given a God-breathed purpose. We exist to equip believers in the Word, in life, in mission, and in ministry. Revival College is founded on biblical principles which are theologically sound and uphold Pentecostal values. We have modernised access. In this ever-changing world, we acknowledge the need to adapt and make use of the wonderful advances in technology. Alongside face-to-face -face engagement, all course materials and student engagement can be accessed online. Students won't just gain a qualification, but also clarity of purpose, a sense of identity, leadership skills, a greater understanding and appreciation for scripture, and of course, draw closer to God in the process. Graduates have had the opportunity to serve within Australia to missions and tours all over the world, including Vanuatu, the Philippines, PNG, Poland, America, and much more. There have been many inspirational stories, locally and internationally, for those who have been part of Revival's training. One of the greatest stories is of Polish student Danuta, who graduated in 2020, and is currently in the process of becoming the first female Pentecostal pastor in Poland. You too can create your own story and play your part in history. Our vision for the future is by 2045 to have a presence in every nation, to partner and co-labor with leaders in their churches across the world, to train, equip and release our students to the front line of making a difference in this world. How will you shape history? Which course will you take? How will you bless the lives of others? Will you answer the call? God is calling. Answer the call. Uh, new name, new identity, and uh, we super appreciate your support in all of that. Uh, the stand uh, for Revival College is out there. I've just been busy uh, putting up all the new material. Uh, you walked in and it was CRC training. You walk out and it's Revival College now. Uh, so, yeah, I'm very tired now uh, from setting that all up. But um, if you would like to uh, come and ask any questions, we've got our brand new prospectus available. Uh, come and grab that. But also, can I just direct you to our website, which is just Revival. Dot college. If you just put that in, um, if I'm honest, our CRC training website previously kind of sucked, uh, whereas this one is actually decent. All right, so it's functional, it works, it helps you, and you can go on, you can check out 
any course that is available through us or Alpha Crucis College, who, is, who we partner with, uh, and you can search any of the units. You can see what the units uh, involve, uh, what the content is, etc. So all the information you need, revival.college, type it into your phone, your iPad, your device, uh, whatever you need. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, come and see me. Thanks, Nathan. Fantastic. So make sure you head out uh, and have a chat to Nick or jump online and uh, check out the website there. We're going to have a 30-minute break now in afternoon tea. So um, uh, those of you here on site, head out uh, to the hall. And um, while on, we're on some of the breaks, just for the online people, we've actually got um, hosting and, and interviews and stuff happening in between sessions as well. So uh, I'm, I'm racing from here to go and do a spot in the studio in just a second. So, um, so for those of you online, uh, we've got lots of those little bits uh, throughout the day uh, as well. Uh, our next session, we've got Loving Jesus Across the Nations. Pastor Jeremy Steele and Pastor Phil Kaiser are going to be sharing. And, uh, and so really looking forward to that, sharing about a stack of stories from uh, ministry that's been happening around the world over the last 12 months. Uh, just again, a reminder with the resources, um, just want to particularly mention Pastor Bill's books. Last year we released Revival is Our Middle Name, and, uh, and you can purchase copies of that out there. Um, if you sign up to a uh, college course this week, uh, then you'll actually get a free ebook of Revival is Our Middle Name. That's an exclusive there. So um, go out, have a chat to Nick, and, uh, and also check out some of Pastor Bill's other books as well. The Me I Can Be, The Church We Can Be, and The Leader I Can Be as well. God bless you. Go and have a break, and we'll see you back here in 30 minutes.